There we go. I'm just going to get a screen share started here. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the next exciting episode of the OERU. So today is the day where the proverbial rubber hits the road and we move in, into the implementation of the OERU uh, first year of study and our strategic planning consultation uh, for the next three year cycle. Um, so I'm not going to speak too much now. Um, and well, I'm not going to introduce you to Andy. I'm going to invite Andy uh, to the podium to give us an update in terms of what's been happening around the CERT HE in business OERU. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Wayne. Can we have the first yes, slides, please? Slides. Slides. Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm from the University of the Highlands and Islands. You'll see our map on the uh, slide there. We consist of 13 partners and we are spread throughout the highlands and islands of Scotland. Um, we also have learning centres, so those, those small dots on the map are our learning centres, so no student in uh, the highlands and islands of Scotland um, is that far away from one of our learning centres and we also do a lot of online work as well. Now the good news that I mentioned yesterday is that we have approved the CERT HE business OERU. So it's now an official um, University of the Highlands and Islands program and we're, we're almost ready for business. Um, having said that, that's a very short sentence but there was, it was an awful lot of work to get there. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, uh, my background is in archaeozoology and I moved to e-learning but luckily I'm also qualified to teach business. So I am the program leader for this new program. I'm a module leader for our three modules and I'm also the chief cook and bottle washer. Um, so the, uh, the approval process, we had to meet academic standards and quality criteria. So it's in line with the uh, UK quality code for higher education and everything, I had to map everything against the um, higher education subject benchworks. So that's a standard process. I'm sure everybody else is, goes through that kind of process within their own countries. Um, but it then moved away from the standard process um, because this is, this is a completely new idea for us. We don't do anything like that, but everybody is 100% behind it. Um, so what we had to do was, um, when I mapped everything and I filled in all the forms, there's something like 17 documents that you have to fill out to take to an approvals process, and one of them was entry criteria. And when I submitted that to the committee, they all said, why are we having entry? We're trying to widen access. So they've actually eliminated entry criteria for this program, which um, is astounding. <laughs> actually, I didn't think they would do that. But because of that, we have to make sure that the, the, the learners are able to, to pass because we don't want them to charge them an assessment fee and then they fail. So as a result of that, I had to write an enormous learner handbook. So here we go, at the moment it's 61 pages long. And we were talking about this yesterday, um, about how we prepare learners for working at OERU. And so this is probably a document that we can work together and expand. And I've written it in what I hope is user-friendly language, because I took our existing handbook, which is terribly dry and dull, and turned it into a handbook that consists of FAQs. So when we put this onto the website, um, they will see things such as, why do I need to read this? Uh, what computer equipment do I need? Uh, how do I stay safe online? How can I improve my learning skills? So that's all about becoming an effective learner. Um, how do I evaluate resources? 
how can I improve my academic writing? Now there, I, I point them straight to Open University's free online course about how to improve academic writing. Um, and then we go um, to how do I write in English as well. So um, again, they get pointed to Open University's free online course at writing academic English. So this book essentially takes them through the entire process. It then shows them the program, um, and then finally we get down to assessment. I'm ready to have my work assessed. What do I do now? And at that stage, we've now written, myself and the registrar at UHI have written an assessment contract. So that deal um, shows exactly what the students, have, oh, sorry, learners, must call them learners, not students. <laughs> See, we keep making that slip. Um, yeah, a student is defined as a legal entity with um, uh, certain rights and entitlements um, at the university. However, um, when these learners come to us, they will become assessment um, candidates and we've created a whole um, contract for them which defines their rights. So that takes them through all of that and um, so far, as I said, we've got 61 pages and there's still more to be added because we have to add the information in about our other partners. Um, for this, it's TESU and uh, Otago Polytechnic. And there's things such as um, uh, Harvard. We use, we, we use Harvard referencing, but we use UHI Harvard, which is an adaptation of Harvard. So we've got to teach the students who come to us, learners who come to us, how to use that. I'm sure the other institutions will use different referencing systems. So we would have to teach them how to use those as well. Um, the good news about this is once they get the, the qualification, so they, they're not our students, so they don't get, they're not entitled to the things our students get. So there's no personal academic tutor or support, um, disability support, things like that. But once they get the actual qualification, they become a UHI graduate, and then they become entitled to everything that our graduates have. So they get a little card which says that they're, they're alumni of the university, they're forever in Scotland, that means they get discounts on things, and they also get two years free access to our careers unit as well. So they move from um, not being recognized at all to fully fledged graduates. So that was the exciting news I wanted to, I mentioned yesterday, and I hope you will find it as exciting as I do. Thanks. Yes, and from the OER Foundation side, a huge thank you. I mean, I work in a t very different time zone and Communications were coming through way past midnight frequently around the, this approval process. So I'd just like to honor you know, Andy's exemplary work in pushing this process through at the university. It's, uh, the student handbook is an exemplar. So thank you very much, Andy. Brenda. Sure. So, hi again, I'm Brenda Thompson, and I'm an Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, beautiful British Columbia. And I'm here with uh, one, two, how many of us are there now? <laughs> one, two, five of us from TRU. So, we are quite uh, heavily invested in this project. We have a, uh, a team of colleagues at home. Um, we meet regularly as a team to work uh, out all of the different aspects of making this happen. Um, I have to say, Andy, I'm, I'm very impressed that the handbook I think will be useful for everyone. I think, thank you, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I guess we had the advantage in the sense that we already have an existing program. We did not need to go through the same steps that Andy did. Of course, if we were creating a new program, we would go through exactly the same steps. We'd have to have it approved by the Ministry of Advanced Education in British Columbia. Um, and I've gone through that process many, many times in my career at TRU. And at times, I, I think the, 
the one I recall t took three years. The big, the, a major, a new major that we created. Minors can take less time. Certificates and diplomas can take at anywhere from a year to 18 months. Um, but they, depending on the government of the day and whether we're going through an election, <laughs> which happens quite a bit in BC, um, sometimes these things can sit on the minister's desk for a long time. So congratulations on getting your program um, approved. But this program already exists. It's actually part of an existing suite of programs in our general studies area. We start out with a certificate, moving into the diploma, and then into the full Bachelor of General Studies. Um, and as uh, being in my role as Associate Dean, I'm the one that signs off on those, those graduates uh, who apply for graduation. And by far, um, the Bachelor of, of General Studies is one of our most popular programs in the arts area for open learning. Um, and students on campus, um, sometimes do a blend. They take campus courses and open learning courses and also graduate out of the Bachelor of General Studies. Uh, we have quite a, quite a mixture and we have, um, because we have the, the, a strong campus space and a very strong open learning uh, um, archive of courses, our students have a lot of choice when it comes to how they, how they proceed, what pathway they take. But this existing certificate is actually one of our uh, I, I really think it's a gem. Um, 30 credits uh, comprised entirely of what you might call electives. Now, if a student is intending to go into a program area, they're going to say eventually major in sociology, for example, they'll be guided through that process by our advisors. And of course, they'll take they'll definitely would, would be taking, you know, two introduction to sociology courses at their first year level because they know they're going to need those foundational courses as they ladder into their degree. But for a student who presents themselves as a course taker, um, or a learner, I should say, as a course taker, and they haven't identified or declared a program area, this is one of the first sort of entry points um, into our, our university. Um, and it, it really will synchronize well with the OERU project because um, the idea here would be that the, to, uh, to graduate with their certificate, um, there has to be a residency component. So, but our residency requirement is six credits of TRU um, TRU credits and we are now offering two courses so we have six credits that we're offering in the OAU uh, consortium. Um, a student can also establish residency however through PLAR. All right that's that's important to remember. You can establish residency through PLAR. What you can't do with PLAR however is establish a GPA. All right so I, what I'm, I'm envisioning is that some of these courses may come into us as PLAR, some of them may come in transcripted, right? And when a course comes in transcripted, transfer credits at TRU typically don't, are not assigned a GPA. Correct, my colleagues? Yes, right. We're, tr we're going to make, have a mechanism to change that. There is a GPA ascribed to it on the transcript that comes in, and we're going to have to have that um, put onto the transcript, right? So there's still, you know, some some things we need to work out. I'm seeing some question marks on faces out here. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, so and then courses that would fall into the categories of uh, uh, such as, sorry. Jeff, yeah. So yeah. <coughs> so the qu uh, question is very interesting that uh, residency can be established through PLA. Yes. But am I correct in saying that transcript credit doesn't qualify as PLA? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Transfer credit is transfer credit. And it normally, transfer credit doesn't, doesn't bring a grade. Okay? And so the, the point here is a, a student has to establish a 2.0 GPA somehow. Right? So if they take our two courses, they're going to be graded and they're going to, they're going to get their grades, 78% or whatever it happens to be. So they're establishing not only GPA, but, and they're also establishing residency. The rest of those credits, the 24 credits, can come in through PLAR as well or on a transcript. Ideally, what we would like to see, my goal would be that all of our partners are able to transcript those credits to us. 
right? Now, in order for that to happen, that's where we have to kick in and really uptake the uh, transfer articulation agreements, right? That's why that's really important. That's really <laughs> significant to me, and it's what I'm working on in the background right now with our subject matter experts at home, looking at all of these courses that are part of the consortium already and saying, okay, introduction to microeconomics. We have a course of the exact same name. Does that, will that establish course for course transfer? Right, and in most cases it will. I've already, we've looked at these, we're, we're well ahead of, in terms of where we're sitting in terms of transfer credit. There are some that we don't have an established course for course articulation. That course simply doesn't exist at TRU. The acronym won't even exist at TRU. So I need to find a place, where am I gonna put it, right? So we need to find the, uh, you know, um, some, the one, about uh, history of the world or world histories, I can't remember where that comes from, um, that would probably come in as unassigned credit for a history. You know, we would use the HIST acronym for that type of thing, right? So I'm not, I'm not worried about that side of it. I think it's just gonna take some work, but diligent work, and I think meeting face-to-face -face really helps us because now when I send you an email, you'll know who I am, and I'm gonna say, I need more details regarding your course. Perhaps can you send me a little bit more detail, or could I communicate with the person who created it, and then I can put my subject matter expert in touch with your subject matter expert, and we can work together on making a course for course reciprocal uh, transfer agreement. I think that was the goal. If you read those documents, the intention is that we create a reciprocal transfer agreements with each other. So I have, I have a TRU student that wants to go somewhere else, take a course somewhere else, they, they're not going to need a letter of permission every time they want to do that, which normally they would. We're going to recognize that course as an OERU course. It's already going to be in our database and we'll simply say, yes, that's fine. You go ahead, take that. It'll come back to your, to your transcript at TRU. We want to make this as seamlessly easy as possible for students. I don't want to set up any barriers. Um, a student simply will you know, apply for this certificate in, in general studies. Um, in this, and when that process starts, they will. We will say, okay, we need all your transcripts. How are we going to do this? How are we going to establish your GPA? How are we going to establish your residency requirement? How are you going to get to your thirty credits? Right. And I, I envision that that process, you know, it might be a few hiccups as we get started, but what I'd really like to do is have a pilot. I'd like to have at least one, the first one, come through our system as a pilot um, and make it, see how we can, we can function and make that work operationally. But we have the full endorsement of our, of our pro, pro, provost and our president and our academic units. Um, uh, Erwin and I just last week while well, we've been we have a, a traveling road show <laughs> that we've been that we've been um, circulating and uh, just last week we presented at the Board of Governors which is our highest level of governance at the university and we were given a very positive response so everyone is on board at TRU regarding this project and uh, yeah I think it's very exciting and uh, I just look forward to working with all of you individually now and we really need to get the course transfer credit articulation agreements worked out. You know, there, there's no holding back now. That's, that's really has to happen now. Any questions? Yep. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, I mean, individual partners are going to be charging an assessment fee for their courses, whatever it costs at a kind of cost recovery basis. But it seems to me there's also some work when people get to the end of this program and you have to make a decision about whether uh, the courses articulate mm -hmm. successfully. Will there be any sort of cost? Are you, is true anticipating any sort of cost for that exercise? Well, we've, we're actually still discussing that side of it, and I'm going to turn to Matt because I think Matt Matt is will be uh, he's part of the lead in, in our team, and we've discussed costing, right? So I'll just let Matt speak to that. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, there would be, but I don't think it would be really major. Uh, so when you apply to a program, there's a a fairly nominal fee. It's what, 20, $25 or something like that to apply to a program and, and get things in motion. But I don't think there's an actual fee for each transcript coming in and being looked at, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. That makes sense? Assessment itself. Yeah. yeah. Of course, uh, for our two courses, if, if a student uh, 
comes to us and says, now I want the assessment for the psych class or the uh, art appreciation class, they will be charged a fee to write the challenge exam. I mean, we, we need to recover that cost because we have to actually um, hire one of our faculty members to mark that exam, right? That's a paid by contract by contract basis. So, um, and we haven't entirely established what that fee will be yet. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, and I think that's important. Another strength of the OERU model is that our partners retain decision-making autonomy over all fees and charges for whatever services, uh, because they do differ from institution to institution. Um, but the real issue is communicating that information accurately to the learners, uh, you know, on the OERU website and with, within the course materials. So that's all good. I just very briefly would like to invite uh, Mark Singer to update us on an interesting development at Thomas Edison State University in relation to some OERU courses. All right. Thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm pulling this up on my phone. My Wi-Fi isn't working very well. But uh, um, so at uh, Thomas Edison, we've been uh, we haven't cr created a, a certificate that's entirely through OERU, but. We have um, just gotten our initial approvals for uh, a first year foundations certificate is what we're calling it. And uh, it does include, um, it's 10 courses, six of them are OERU courses. An additional two are directly from the Sailor Academy and then two um, we're in the process of, of making open. And so I guess those will be part of the OERU universe if, if folks want them. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit maybe uh, similar to what, uh, what Thompson Rivers is doing, but um, it's, it's meant to satisfy our uh, general education requirements of so written communications and, and uh, information literacy and, and uh, critical reasoning, those sorts of things. So uh, we, like, uh, like I said, we've gotten the initial approvals. We're developing um, one new course, which is uh, an introductory science course. Um, and we're developing, as, as we've discussed here, a, a couple of uh, exams of sort of uh, challenge exams that uh, would uh, show up at the end of the uh, at the end of the course but otherwise the courses will all be uh, entirely open and available for our students um, or yours presumably yeah. so just wanted to make a brief announcement I'll, I'll have a little bit more information for you in the next uh, <laughs> month or two thanks very much mark and again and you know another potential pathway for an OERU learner in, in achieving an, an exit award so slowly this is coming together. Right. Uh, what I'd like to do now is invite Dave. Because then I'll just do that last bit just before we're going to um, break out. Okay. How do you want to connect? Uh, I'll just create a new tab. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So I'm just going to take a moment to load my presentation. This time I'm hoping it'll work out a little bit better. Uh, okay. So now, yeah, so um, the question here is uh, where do we go, given what we've got now, which is to a certain extent what I showed you yesterday, uh, where are we going next? Um, and what do we want to do during the MVP, which is still really to start fully? Uh, and then what do we want to do having achieved the MVP? What's, what are the next steps beyond that? Um, oh, for goodness sake. It's not advancing, sorry. Here we go. So yeah, we've been busy doing the integration of components that I told you about yesterday and swapping out the old for the new and um, reinforcing some of the existing ones. Um, and uh, we're running things down to uh, protect against the so-called bus factor, which if you've ever been involved in IT projects and perhaps other sorts of projects, you'll be familiar with the idea that the person who's doing, has the knowledge about these things end up stepping in front of a bus accidentally. 
uh, and then everyone else is left to pick up the pieces. So the idea is to write things down in such a way that someone else can hopefully pick up the reins if, if necessary. Um, the other thing, of course, the other side effect of that is that others in the, uh, the network have potentially the ability to um, replicate some of the things that we've done um, in, their own, in their own institutions with uh, minimal pain and um, have a chance to have a, go, have a try with them. Um, I just wanted to very briefly show you a couple examples of the things that we've done um, a little bit more uh, with, with pictures and so on rather than what I showed yesterday. Um, uh, since the last time we gave this roadmap in, in Inverness last year. Um, this just is an example of, uh, we mentioned yesterday, Mastodon. It's an it's a open source social network like Twitter, um, except that you get 300 characters instead of 140, so you can actually say something a little bit more interesting. Um, and this is a, anyway, I won't, I won't go into too much detail about each of them, but the idea behind this is it gives, it gives learners a place to um, experiment with social networking and microblogging uh, in a place that doesn't have uh, it doesn't force them to conform to Twitter's terms of con terms and conditions, and it also um, can be somewhat um, sheltered from the outside world. So only only people who are involved in the program would potentially have accounts in this. But it also well, I'll, I'll, I can talk to people about it if they're interested to hear more. Um, this is uh, another thing that we've just recently uh, set up to replace our use of Google Forms for for surveying and polling and coordinating things across uh, groups of people, like organizing attendance at meetings and so on. So we've got Lime Survey, which is a hugely powerful um, surveying engine that you could use to do um, assessments, perhaps, and other things as well um, over time. And, oops, sorry. This is Mautic, which we mentioned yesterday, which is the uh, marketing automation software. So this just shows three different screenshots overlaid. The first one is actually editing a, a template email. Um, so you have the ability to create HTML emails uh, that carry your branding and all that. Um, and then the second slide behind that with the lines and the boxes is a, is a rule set so that you can set up the conditions under which emails are sent. And, you know, if this happens, then send this email. If that happens, send that email and add this person to that list and so on. And you can verify and, and um, you get uh, analytics about all these things. And the last one is just showing some of the kind of depth of the, the settings and so on that you can have. Um, this is, uh, shows the updates that we've done to our WeNotes um, aggregated social media, kind of pulling all these different uh, channels together into a single feed for each course. Um, just shows you the kinds of technologies that we're um, pulling information out of the technologies that we're using for storing it and distributing it, and then the places where that information can then be uh, viewed. So at the moment, WordPress and MediaWiki are, are the two places that we um, can display the feeds, but that, that can potentially increase as well. And this is just to show you the, an example. Of, this is the front page of our technology blog that just gives you an idea. The right, right column there is the, the, the recent posts, and there's you know, pages of those posts. Of uh, Each one is a recipe on how to build one of the components of our, or how to set up one of the components of our um, technology stack. So during the MVP, there's still a few things we'd like to do. We think we're pretty much ready to go. Um, it's just these are, you know, the software is never done, so there's always something you could do to improve things. Um, we have a keen interest, especially now that we've been here in Toronto and talking to people who have got a real um, focus on accessibility. We would really like to develop a new um, theme for our WordPress uh, course sites that is um, making use of better, uh, more updated <laughs> adaptive layout technology that will help us um, uh, provide um, proper, proper theming for mobile devices as well as desktop computers and everything in between, but also we want to have it be built from the ground up for, for accessibility. So to maximize the opportunities or provide the fewest barriers for people to ensure they can access our materials. Another thing we're looking at is um, uh, setting up a kind of a community source, as we refer to it, um, program whereby at least one technical individual at each of the partner institutions is involved um, in a kind of a informal one day a month, say, we're, that's just throwing that sort of time frame out, um, one day a month that they, that they work with me and, and their, their colleagues, um, the other people involved in this from the other partner institutions to perhaps just do a, um, a web-based uh, 
discussion about one or more of the technologies that we're looking at in case the institutions have an interest in, in implementing them themselves. So basically to help get the ball rolling and uh, to gain some insight as well into what the partner institutions might find useful. Um, we also are thinking about, uh, and, and this was mentioned yesterday as well, we've, we've been thinking also that we need to improve the way that uh, students can actually, or sorry, learners can, can find information on our website. We, we agree that our website uh, needs a fair bit of work to improve the ease with which people can see what uh, courses are available and how to actually um, take part in them. Uh, so yeah, we've, got a, we've, we've been discussing it for a number of months, and so we have, we have plans for doing it, we just haven't done it yet. Um, and then there's also things like infrastructure. Um, what happens if, if our MVP is so successful that we suddenly have 100,000 students and we need to make sure that our technology, we know where the bottlenecks in our technology are, so we know what needs to be beefed up to be able to withstand those kinds of numbers. Um, we don't have any reason to think that it's going to be um, any, it, all of the technologies we've created have been built with that kind of those kinds of numbers in mind anyway, so we're, we have high hopes that it won't be a big, a big problem, but we need to be able to measure it to be sure. So beyond the MVP, um, we have plans to do things like uh, improve the way our WeNote system is, is um, set up. The, the prototype that we currently are using is very much a prototype. Um, it was put together by my predecessor, Jim Titzler, who some of you will have met over uh, in, in past years. Um, he did a very clever job on it, but in the meantime, a number of useful things have happened. So, for example, there is an emerging standard for messaging systems called Matrix, which um, we would be keen to take uh, to adopt, and it it's, it actually would reduce our work workload to a certain extent because we could leverage the work that the community has done, um, providing a, a useful container in which to store messages and make them available. Um, and we're thinking a, a learner dashboard would be quite useful for, for people who are involved in our courses to be able to see the courses that they've previously done, perhaps do things like um, uh, um, register an interest in a course and then have be, be made aware of when that course is next being run as a cohort, um, or um, be able to review past activities. Um, if we had, for example, some kind of um, milestones for participation and so on, that they could see how they're tracking through something like this, um, and then perhaps um, also have a gateway uh, access to the various partners who might be of interest to them or in their neighborhood or uh, you know, that sort of thing. And we're also looking at the possibility of creating a learner-generated assessment item bank with questions and answers created by learners and tested you know, as part of their coursework, uh, something that, that would allow us to essentially open source the, um, the assessment capabilities uh, and, and over time um, create a compelling, well-regarded set of, of questions that could then be used ultimately for automated testing. Um, and we have a number of sort of fledgling efforts in this area. Um, there's a, 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 some Moodle plugins that have some interesting implications and this, uh, this group Tau Testing have, have got an interesting platform for, for managing this sort of thing which is all open source so we're looking at perhaps collaborating with them and making use of the work that they've done. Um, so yeah, that's it and so yeah, I, you can see this is similar to yesterday's but yes, thanks very much to uh, the partners for letting me be here and uh, to eCampus Ontario and uh, the Chang School for having us. All right. And yeah, yes. Oh, hang on, hang on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the dashboard, the student dashboard. Yes. Is that So, yes, Erwin's just asking if the dashboard uh, we have in mind would require someone to log in. Um, yes, it would, it would require someone to log in, but the idea is that the only onus on the learner is that, that, so we don't require them to log in, but if they want the benefit of those kinds of, that kind of information, then they would, yes, have to log in. We similarly require uh, learners to log in to comment, uh, or to post comments on the Wii Notes, for example, just because we don't, the, the idea of allowing anonymous commenting um, tends to lead to bad behavior and things like that, so, Logging yeah. will always be optional with us, and materials will always be able to be accessible without logging in. Any other questions? No? Okay, but anyway, happy to talk to people about this uh, later, and you can see the presentation right there.
so all the presentations in the meeting report here. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks. So all the presentations will be linked in the meeting report. As you well know, we have an, an open report in the wiki after each meeting, and so all the resources will be there. So I need to get out the full screen. <laughs> so basically, just very briefly, I'm not going to speak too much to this, but we um, have a... a a credit transfer agreement that has been discussed by the active partners, the uh, discussed and approved by the registrars of the active partners engaged in the assessment and credit transfer of the first year of study. So that's all been done. <laughs> we also distributed a survey to all the OERU partners because obviously any OERU partner that wanted to offer assessment services for any of the OERU courses would be in a position to do that. Um, so we distributed a survey to find out if which of the partners wanted to. Of course, all the partners that are actively engaged in this process will be offering assessment services. But to date, none of the other partners uh, are planning to offer assessment services for any of the OBRU courses. I'm just mentioning this because if you are planning to do this, we need to get it sorted very soon because there are agreements and approval processes that need to be in place. So if you are thinking of, you know, prototyping assessment services for one or two courses, you need to get that done ASAP so we can get all the other approvals in place for, you know, these, these credit transfer pieces. So that's basically that. So the purpose of this session is we're going to have a look at a couple of things. Uh, we need to determine a launch schedule for the OERU first year of study. So from on the meeting site, if you haven't noticed yet, um, under the resources section, that you will find a list of all the courses that are available for the first year of study. Okay. Um, we need to determine a launch schedule. We've done phase one, phase two, but the task of this working group will be, think, will be to look at the launch schedule for phase three and beyond. Which courses are we going to prioritize and how are we going to group them? So that's the purpose of that group. Uh, let me get back here. So that was the first group. Um, the marketing group is going to continue. Uh, and I'll come and have a quick chat with the marketing group because I have linked to the resources you requested from yesterday. And I can quickly show you where those are. Um, we will have a technology breakout group for anybody that wants to help discuss and refine and add to uh, the technology roadmap for you know, 20, 2018 and beyond. And the last group is the basically to uh, generate the checklist for launching an OERU course. What are the things that need to be in place uh, in order to launch? We use a, 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 another piece of open source technology called uh, Canboard, uh, which is a project management tool that will enable us to uh, project manage the launch of all these courses. And the system is such that whoever is assigned within your organization, if they have particular responsibilities, we can then you know, give them accounts on the system. They'll receive email notifications of what needs to be done, when it needs to be done by, and you know, all, all of the above. You'll appreciate launching you know, 20 plus courses uh, over the next period. It, there's quite a bit of project management involved and we are a distributed network. So we need to, you know, you use these project planning technologies to be able to do that. And so the purpose of the, the action list is really to help us populate the project management system, if you see what I'm saying. So if you know what the activities are, we can then populate the project management. Okay. So just a brief show, a brief show of hands. I just want to see if we've got viable groups. Uh, the folk that would be keen to help out determine the launch schedule, show of hands. I'm sure Andy will want to be in that group, hey? The launch schedule. Oh, okay, the technology. Okay, yeah, because I'm just, because around the business courses, you'd have inside information that would be quite relevant. Okay, thanks, Andy. And then we can have the conversation around the tech stuff. Um, 
marketing group is established. So if anyone wants to join in with the marketing group, please feel free to do so. Um, technology group. Yet we have a viable group there. And determining the activity list for launching courses. Okay, so we've got a viable group. So then let's do it up. Brenda, we won't move. We'll have um, the launch schedule group one uh, here in the middle at Brenda's table. Um, the marketing group, uh, Jane, any preference? Shall we move uh, to where Lindsay's sitting here? The marketing group, technology at this table here. And the due diligence activity list at David's table. Yes, Mark. Okay, so the, the, it's the activity that what are the things that must be done to launch an OERU course? Yeah, we need to audit that the links work. We need to make sure that the contract agreement is in place. We need, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Right, thank you very much.